Okay. Hello, world. Uh, everyone. It's Justine Tebow with the Red Nation and Red Media here today. I am joining you with a few others from New York City on stolen Lenape land. Uh, today is April 20th, and we are recording the panel, The State of Indigenous Peoples Under the State of Emergency in El Salvador. This is a UN in, uh, permanent forum of Indigenous Issues side event, and it's a report back on Indigenous Congress for Decolonization. Back in January, uh, myself and members of the Red Nation went to El Salvador for this Congress, and today we'll be talking a little bit about how that event went and, um, and what our thoughts are. So I'm joining you with a few others. We're going to go around and introduce ourselves. <clears throat> Everyone, my name is Demetrius. You can call me D. Uh, been with the Red Nation since 20, 2015. Um, but yeah, just we got here last week um, wanting to help the, came to support the Leonard Peltier Defense Committee. Uh, speaking at the UN, um, but also to do this event specifically. Um, so it's good to be here. First time, uh, first time caller, long time listener out here in uh, Lenape land. Good afternoon. My name is Sar Metzti. I'm with Colectivo Milpa, and I'm so glad to be part of this discussion and to have some reflections on the Indigenous Congress. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Daniel Flores y Asensio. Eh, yo soy Maya Aguachapaneco por el lado de mi tata y Nonualca por el lado de mi nana. Resido en el Departamento de La Paz, El Salvador. Eh, and I'm here to, to participate in the UN Permanent Forum, which is open after the pandemia. Eh, and push for or cause back home, which is uh, unfortunately has been under siege for a whole year now. And we want to talk about how that is coming along and how it's affecting our society and specifically our indigenous society. Bueno, saludo para todos los que nos escuchan. A ustedes también. Buenas tardes a todos. Buenas tardes. Soy Luis López. Soy originario de Santiago, Texacuango. Antes se pronunciaba Texacuangos porque éramos tres pueblos, pero ahora sabemos que era uno. Eh, yo no represento a ninguna organización. Soy parte de... Eh, el indigismo de, eh, separado dentro del de mestizaje. Eh, estoy aquí eh, gracias a eh, haber conocido a Daniel. Él me introdujo a formar parte en el trabajo de la creación del Congreso y hoy eh, estoy aquí también por él. Así de que gracias a todos. Hi, everyone listening. To all of you, good afternoon. My name is Luis Lopez. I am from Santiago, Texacuango. Before it was uh, Texacuangos, because it was three communities, but now there's only one. I don't represent an organization. I am part of uh, the indigenous community um, in the process of mestizaje. And I am here because I met Daniel, and he got me involved in the Congress. So I'm here because of him. Thank you. And that's our wonderful translator. Would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> I will be Luisa's translator. My name is Samantha. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Samantha. And thank you all for joining. Thank you all for being here. I know we all came a long way to be here today. Um, let's start with 
who do we want to pick on first? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I wanna, uh, actually, I want to pick on you, Sar. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm so, ready. can you tell us a little bit about Colectivo Milpa and the organizing for the uh, for the Congress? On a short, I guess I'm going to give you a short version of Colectivo Milpa. But Colectivo Milpa hasn't always existed as Colectivo Milpa. It's uh, we've been called. It was mostly like a loosely network of. Central Americans over like the past five years that have been working with Daniel and around being here when a lot of indigenous people here. And I think the formation of Central Americans from either from El Salvador or from elsewhere coming here um, essentially led to the formation of Colectivo Mil, but precisely to support the indigenous Congress in El Salvador. And we wanted to really uh, support this indigenous-led effort because uh, we wanted to experiment with mutual aid, but from afar, and what that would look like, and how real, genuine partnership with indigenous-led movements actually looked like as part of a wide diaspora. So it was an idea that we experimented for like maybe seven years until it led to the Congress. So, um, and we're like loosely tied because diaspora like the Central America diaspora is all over the place and the way everyone came to support the Congress when it finally you know form and the structure was there everyone essentially plugged in just because of the pandemic and capacity and everything when everyone had their time and it was just like this wonderful organic collaboration of people like being all over the place in Central America, you know, like, or in New Mexico in the games of Petouche or things like that, or, you know, in Europe or like in Canada or people like just plugged in from everywhere but not necessarily being present, but because of like the virtual collections, it became this, essentially this idea of how do we move together, you know, in a genuine way using mutual aid to like really do something that's very unique in terms of partnering with people back home leading struggles. And it's really about that. Thank you. And um, how, so um, how the Red Nation had gotten involved was actually through Petuch, who we are very good comrades with. We are from Acoma Pueblo. And um, Patuch introduced us to Danielle about maybe like a year ago, maybe more. And we began having conversations about decolonization and solidarity with uh, Central and South America. And um, through those conversations, um, eventually, I, I mean, I remember in the beginning, they were telling us like, um, oh, we're planning to meet up in El Salvador and mm-hmm. we're planning to have uh, you guys there. And it, you know, uh, the pandemic happened and stuff, so that pushed things back a little more. But we eventually met up in January, and the um, Indigenous Congress was held in Nawisalco. So, uh, Danielle, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about the Congress and how it went and organizing in El Salvador. Well, it's quite interesting what Sar is mentioned. Uh, We've been organizing for many years, and, and Petuch and I go way back. But uh, what the organization, what we're trying to do really is organize for self-determination. And this is, has been the essential component of, uh, of do whatever we do. In either in the UN or back home in our communities, is try to organize and in in try to practice some of the autonomy that we we like to uh, live by, which is a it's a bit complicated. But what is interesting in all this is in the process of organizing for self determination, uh, we have make a lot of acquaintance, but also we have people who were willing to organize along with us, such as the Colectivo Milpa, and, and how that become is not, is not particular for 
the people in the diaspora, I might say, is also back home. Uh, putting together this event uh, in the midst of, of the regime of exception, which is actually the regime of, uh, of dictatorship at this point, it, it was not easy. But what was interesting is that uh, we, we were able to pull people from different organizations. And, and when we present the idea of having a, a Congress, an indigenous Congress on decolonization, maybe uh, it was a little abstract, but there was a, a sense of a partnership, a sense of need to come together at that particular time. Specifically, as, as like you're saying, after the after two years intense, you know, reclusion and and health problems with the COVID, but also because I think the indigenous peoples back home is ready to to do the leap, uh, and and they feel not only politically uh, ready, but I think they have also see the potential to join forces with the diaspora. Uh, as you know, we have uh, almost 15 years of civil war in El Salvador. It has created a lot of problems for us back home. Uh, and as well uh, here in a sense, because uh, in the US, uh, lots of people move here. So we have 15, 30 plus years of the, the people being displaced. And ha that have create a, a new a new platform, I, will sh I should say, uh, in people who came here when they were a ch child, 15, five years old, six years old, so even 10 years old, so now they're full professionals with not, with not so much baggage. Uh, ideological baggage that uh, that that has been on the past. So this uh, this collaboration with the diaspora has been very productive, but also I think uh, people back home uh, are looking forward with this kind of relationship. And so we felt that the Congress have not only provide a vehicle for organizing, but also consolidate some of these efforts. So, uh, in fact, you were there, so you, you can also see what the interactions were. And what Sar say that we have people from Britain uh, participating, Salvadorian descendants, uh, we have people from the USA, of course, uh, and people in Canada, also no, not Salvadorians, but uh, they watch what we were doing, and they they follow us. So it's been a uh, very well received, and uh, I think this is. And we, here we are again. So I think this is a a good possibilities to continue in this route. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I want to ask Juan Luis, um, what how is your experience as an indigenous person from El Salvador? Um, for the Congress for decolonization. A mí me pareció un evento que es como un despertar de los pueblos, porque a donde tengo conocimiento es el primero o segundo primero. Congreso que se hace a nivel de pueblo indígena. Eh, como decía en mi presentación anterior, de que yo no conozco muy bien cómo está organizado el, el, el pueblo nativo en Nahuizalco, en la zona occidental. Yo soy de la parte central y además de ser de la parte central, soy de la parte no organizada. Soy indígena, 100%, pero eh, de esos que están eh, 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 disueltos entre... Eh, Un, 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 un gran conglomerado de gente, ¿verdad? Muchos hemos quedado eh, perdidos en esa forma 
podría, podríamos llamarnos perdidos por las, uh, el sistema de, de, de combate que ha tenido el sistema hacia nuestra raza. O sea, nos ha combatido de diferentes formas, nos ha separado eh, de diferentes formas, las guerras, el, el mestizaje, eh, el dinero también, va, el incentivo ese del individualismo, ¿verdad? eso nos ha hecho este, eh, perder nuestra identidad, en otras palabras. ¿verdad? Pero eh, yo soy uno de los que eh, conozco mi identidad y estoy consciente del de sufrimiento de nuestra raza ¿verdad? desde el principio en que llegaron los españoles ¿verdad? hasta la fecha, cómo nos han venido tratando de eliminar a través de la historia. Pero a pesar de tantos años de esfuerzo por eliminarnos, todavía aquí estamos. Y yo creo de que ese es, ese es un logro para nosotros. Así de que ver el Congreso eh, eh, en Nahuizalco eh, haciendo eh, ruido, puede decirse, no solo a nivel nacional, sino también internacional, porque pues, eh, hubo, hubo mucha asistencia. Ustedes estuvieron allá. La radio, que fue eh, también un elemento muy... muy bueno para el evento. Yo creo de que eh, fue como la columna vertebral del evento porque lo transmitió a todo el país y fuera del país. Este, así que yo estoy entusiasmado y no sé si voy a poder participar dentro de la parte de los Nahuizalcos o trabajo en la parte donde él mencionaba que yo soy también de, de esa zona. Eh, no sé tan, qué tan cierto es si puedo decir que eh, soy de los nonualcos, ¿va? pero sí somos de ese, de ese, de ese contorno de los, de los nonualcos. Así de que estamos este, eh, eh, hoy en día pues, este, preparándonos para esa batalla eh, nosotros como pueblo creíamos que ya no se iba a ver la desal, desa, desalojación de gente de sus tierras, pero a pesar de, de eso, hoy en día se está dando en algunos poblados, eh, gente está siendo eh, sacada de sus tierras por el hecho de que el nuevo régimen quiere construir... Eh, eh, centros hoteleros o centros turísticos, un tren, un aeropuerto, eh, recuperar este, también la expropiación de, de, no, perdón, recuperar la extracción de metales, eh, como es el oro, la plata, ¿verdad? eso se había suspendido, pero hoy en día él este, eh, ha reactivado ese, esa idea y por cierto, pues hay como seis compañeros también este, indígenas, prisioneros, por el hecho de que pertenecen a una organización de medio ambiente. ¿verdad? Eso, es decir, de que estamos en eso. Yo creo de que son tiempos nuevos. Yo creo que en estos tiempos nuevos nosotros como raza indígena vamos a jugar un papel muy importante. Gracias. I think that this was the first event that was truly organized by indigenous people. As far as I know, it's the first or the second, no, the first event organized by the indigenous people. And I was present and I was able to say, well, I am from Nagwisariko and we saw here that this is an area where there are indigenous people. I am 100% indigenous but the community is spread out amongst many other people. And a lot of people are lost, or you could call them lost because of the system and the effect that it's had on our race. It's fought against us, it's divided us, and many are therefore lost to wars, to mestizaje, to financial reasons, to the incentives provided by individualism. 
And so to say, many、mm-hmm. people lose their identity, but I have my identity, and I'm aware of the suffering of my race <clears throat> since the Spanish arrived until today. Throughout this whole timeline, they've tried to eliminate us, but despite all their efforts over the years, we are still here, and that is a success. I was there at the Congress in Nagusarico, and we made noise both at the national as well as the international level. There were many people in attendance. All of you were there, and the radio was also a great tool since it was able to broadcast the event nationally and abroad. So I am very excited, and I don't know,、um, but well, I am from Nagusarico, but I'm also from elsewhere, from Nonualco, and. I don't know if I could say I'm from there, but we also had、uh, activities there. And today, I'd like to say that we are ready to continue in this struggle. We, as a people, never thought we would see our people displaced from their lands, but that is currently happening in some places. People are being removed from their lands. We have this new regime that wants these lands in order to build hotels and tourism centers. They want to build a train and an airport, and they even want to reactivate metal extraction, such as for gold and silver, which had been previously suspended. But now the idea is to reactivate these se- sectors. So I know that there are at least six indigenous colleagues. That are currently being held prisoners because they belong to an environmental organization. And while this is a new era, and we as indigenous people are here to stay in this new era.、Uh, muchas gracias. That's amazing. And、uh, when, when we were in El Salvador, we all learned so much about. The history and the people, and what it means to be indigenous there.、Um, I learned that El Salvador is the most densely populated country in Central America, and that alone is one of the reasons why native land is like so hard to to keep out there, and and all of that.、Um, yeah, and a part of like my reason for. Being out there, I was also there with、uh, Comrade Cheyenne, Kara, and Myra.、Um, you know, we're comrades in the Red Nation, and we're internationalists, and we believe that like our tribes here in、um, in the U.S., you know, we're not free unless you all are free, and 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 that's like pretty much the basis of our politics as Indigenous、um, revolutionaries. Um, and it was such an experience to be、uh, in the global south. That was my first time、uh, south of the U.S. Mexico border, and it it was、um, it was such a present to be out there for for all of us, and、um, and it was very um, um. I don't know, like、uh, like something I always say is that like us, like Pueblo people, like culturally we are more similar to you all because we got we were under conquest by Spain as well. I feel like we're closer、mm-hmm. in terms of culture with the global, with you know Central and South America than we are to like Lakotas, <laughs> you know. So、mm-hmm. it's been it was it was a really great experience because even like.、Um, I would say the most significant part of the Congress was during、uh, the women's panel for me, and、uh, I don't remember the woman speaking, but she was speaking to the issues of a regular Pueblo woman where I'm from, and she talks about she she was talking about equity in the home, and how are we supposed to expect women in our families to organize for revolution and for our decolonization, when they're expected to take care of the kids, take care of the family, take care of the in-laws, and、um, she got in trouble for saying that by by somebody、um, through no fault of your own. <laughs> I heard you know you later found out that guy wasn't invited, but <laughs> but.、Um, But 
when I came back and when this man, he got mad at her, he was actually like, um, it was, it was actually violent. He was shaking when he was telling her, he, he was very offended that he would even, that she would even like insinuate that men aren't doing enough. You know, mm. he was very upset and it was crazy for me because when I came back home, uh, I have an uncle who is very intimidated by me and my work in the Red Nation. He is, he is also bothered by it because of those, because of, you know, because, because we're women organizing, we're women who have to challenge patriarchy and challenge those, like those, you know, traditional gender laws that were imposed on us from Spanish colonization. And so the same machismo culture it, it exists in my own pueblos in, up here. But uh, he, he was the first one that sort of like pretty much replicated that man and his, how he, how he was speaking, his voice started getting louder and I, I was eventually being yelled at. He was the first man. The second man was a guy from that I met in Albuquerque who I was trying to talk to and he talked to me the same exact way. And there was a third man who talked to me in the same way. And I was just, I was just blown away because I saw that guy in El Salvador um, through my relatives up here. So while I was, um, while it was unfortunate to experience like violent patriarchy, it was also, I was also comforted by the, by the fact that our struggles are so, so, so they like embody each other and we're, we're a lot more connected than we actually like, like know. And it was just an experience to go to El Salvador and, and, and witness that and then come home and immediately witness the same exact thing. So I, I, I just, I just gotta thank y'all so much for allowing me to your lands and allowing us to be a part of this Congress. Um, but yeah, so so that makes so that moves me to my next question for you all. What were the like re, those kind of reflections that you had? Uh, what were your personal like things that sort of like moved you from this? Do you have like any specific moments? I think there are various, I think, but I think overall, what was important, I think, that the Congress highlighted is uh, how uh, nation to nation can actually happen. Mm -hmm. That kind of like building allegiances like among indigenous people. Uh, we're here in the US, and I think we constantly see it here amongst indigenous people in the North, but like to do it from North to South and South to North. That was, I think, a huge, huge element of the Congress that I think we wanted to see how Central American indigenous movements are completely aligned with the global indigenous movements. And I think that was very palpable throughout every single presentation, with about 20 percenters, I think, or something like that. And the themes were so aligned, right? We're all talking about the same thing, the same struggles, but to put it in that recycle as a center, I don't think it has ever been seen in that light. I think for me, that was the most transformative thing of the Congress, how we can actually come together and build what I hope can be permanent allegiances, right? And like help each other. The whole mutual aid concept was built into the Congress. Like that we can, you can lead and we can like, I think for, my, for me personally, it was very interesting as I was participating in the organizing, uh, you know, I think you were like in one of the early ones and how that was more communal than what I've seen here in some organizing circles, right? We're like, you know, like we have professional organizers here, right? We're like, mm. you have stack, you have like somebody taking notes and like, you know, everyone is like managing every aspect of your meeting where over there is really folks organizing almost like it's orally, but it's militant, but you didn't see it from like the folks back home, right? In such a way, it was such an eye-opening experience for me because that it it made it it made me center my attention on listening more than being an active participant of a meeting. Just listening, paying attention, 
And, and that is mutual aid in my opinion, because you just, you're not leading, but you kind of are by just listening first. And I think that was very humbling for me in my experience, not necessarily the topics, but I think the act of how collaborating with people from afar, because we weren't there, right? Um, that was huge, I think, and transformative in many ways as a collective to do it, honoring people who are leading things on the ground and how it compares to everything that everyone else is doing outside of Central America, here in the U.S. or in Canada or wherever, whatever indigenous people are organizing. I think that was that was very transformative, and to and to really put it in Maui South and centering it there and having that dialogue there, I think was very significant. Bueno, sí, es, es con respecto a la pregunta de ella, de, 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 de la, 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 la forma en que ella lo ve, va, uh -huh. este, es sobre el, el, la mujer, va, yo no entendí bien esa parte. Sí, la mujer, pero él quiere saber cuáles han sido las experiencias particulares uh -huh, uh -huh. que tú tienes de, le, de haber estado presente en, en el Congreso. En el evento, ok. Sí, bueno, eh, la mujer, claro, es el, el creo que es el, el sujeto eh, central de, del Congreso. Eh, hubo un tema específico solo para, para la mujer, que se le llamó el cuerpo de la mujer como territorio. En donde, y, y, y no se tocó muy, muy bien el fondo, yo creo que. Sí. No se entendió muy bien, ¿verdad? pero sí yo creo de que la mujer, eh, de mi punto de vista, también es, tiene que ser el, el, el centro de todo, de todo el universo, porque para empezar, de ella como hombres dependemos, ¿verdad? y no solo dependemos, sino que nos... Nos, nos, nos cuida durante toda la vida hasta que podemos valernos por nosotros mismos. Por ese eh, mismo hecho, creo de que ella tiene más derechos que el hombre, pero por el, el hecho este del, del, de las políticas eh, eh, del sistema donde utiliza al hombre como, como el ser principal de una sociedad, eh, delega a la mujer a un segundo nivel, ¿verdad? cuando debería en realidad ser lo contrario. Y lo que usted mencionaba, de acuerdo a la ponencia de la compañera, sobre eh, el trabajo de la mujer en el hogar, es, 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 es parte de eso. ¿verdad? Así que yo creo de que mi experiencia mayor fue esa, ver a la, a la mujer empoderada de... de de su trabajo, eh, no solo en la casa, porque el acto que las, eh, la compañera hizo fue también este, político, fue económico, cultural. Sí, yo creo de que eh, ella posicionó muy bien a la mujer. Esa fue eh, mi mejor experiencia. Well, I think that women were one of the main subjects of the Congress. We had one specific event called the body of women as territory. And at the end of the day, I don't think that this concept was uh, that well understood. We didn't dive as deeply into it as we could have. But from my point of view, women must be at the center of everything. They must be at the center of the universe. Just to start off with, we as men depend on women Um, we don't only just depend on them, but at the beginning, they take care of us. They take care of us and make sure that we're okay. And that's why I think that women actually deserve to have more rights than men. But due to the political system, they place men as the main person at the, at the center. And then women kind of get left to the side. But it should truly be the opposite because... It's what you were mentioning, what our comrade said at her speech about the role of women at home. And this is all part of it. 
So I think that my main experience was to see women empowered by their work and not just by what they do at the house, at the homes. Um, but it's really what our comrade said. And this was an act that was political. It was economic. It was cultural. And I think that that was truly my favorite part to see women empowered. Oh. Yo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because um, so it was myself, Cheyenne, Kara, and Myra who went. It was all women from the Red Nation who went to El Salvador. And that was definitely something that we acknowledged because we were we're women standing up from our own nations all together. And it was definitely an experience. Like I felt like we were, uh, I felt like people at the Congress um, acknowledged that too. So it was very special. I think the Congress provide a platform. Uh, first of all, uh, let me say that the Congress was organized for, by people indigenous people. And this is perhaps the first time that an event of this magnitude was organized by indigenous peoples. And I think that alone uh, has some credit because usually uh, folks back home uh, are cater a lot for for the government. If, if the government calls a meeting, they, we all run to those meetings of the NGO calls a meeting. We all run to those meetings. If the church calls a meeting, we're all there. So uh, this is the first time we we, we managed to, to come together uh, and do it. Uh, and I think it, there were a couple of subjects that were important. Uh, women, of course, uh, was one of the highlights. Uh, but coming to that point to, to do it in Awisalco, uh, it was not easy, but it, it was, uh, after all, it was the right place. Uh, now, Wisalco sits in, in, in the western part of the El Salvador, and is is actually on ancestral lands. Uh, in one of the, the, the village, which is uh, perhaps guards their traditions, ancestral traditions uh, today. And language is being spoken still uh, in Nahuizalco. Uh, and the struggle uh, of that area during the war, uh, in previous, even before uh, contact, uh, that area has been really very important for El Salvador. And, uh, and it's one of the, the Nahuatl field is one of the nations who have managed to still, even though uh, a lot of hardships still uh, still hold true to their convictions and to the culture. Uh, and it's amazing uh, even today how, how our societies is work in this, in this area. And, and how we decide to come to Nahuizalco, it was not an easy decision. We, practically explore different different villages and different areas uh, where we can help the Congress. Originally it was planned for, well, it, it is, it was three days, but originally it was planned three different communities. Oh. But when, when we felt that there, the conditions were not uh, ideal to, to help uh, to help in different communities, uh, and beside, because of the the the, uh, the 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 situation, the political situation, specifically with the the regime of exception, it was it was going to be very hard to move people around. And secondly, uh, that some of the communities were not ready. For, for really engage in this kind of this kind of dialogue and, and commitment that you need to, to put together something like that. And I I, I want to give lots of credit to the people of Nahuizalco, to my brothers and sisters who made this happen, because I think they're, they, 
in the Western territories, specifically the, the Nahuatl people who had been in the for, forefront of the indigenous struggle in El Salvador, uh, and they are the majority, they, they seem more, more not only ready, but more in try engaging in, in these kind of things. Because as I say earlier, we, we're ready to take this to a different level. And that's the struggle that we have right now. Uh, unfortunately, uh, women, because of machism and because of other things, are having difficulties to be a, a position of leadership. Uh, and, uh, and so we made a point to bring, uh, to bring the to bring this issue and women's struggle up front in the, in the Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was nice because, uh, for instance, uh, the sister who, who was there uh, helping with this particular panel, uh, she wants to switch it. Uh, and we say, go ahead, just do it whatever you think is, is the best. And, uh, and, and, and we want your input into this from from the organ, not only from the. Or she was not part of the organization, but at that particular moment where she was coordinating that event, that the the women's panel, she wants to do it her way, and we say, go ahead, do it, uh, and and later on she say, you know, I, I'm really appreciative that you you keep me there. The, and you give us the lead way to organize it the way we want it. And I think it, it, giving women the opportunity to, to run with, with the project and, uh, and organize them, it, it, it works. It works. It's not, there is no capable. We have women so committed and so. Uh, given and to organize in these type of events. What we we felt, we or we identified quite a few women, in fact, that came to the Congress as a key element to work with and provide venues to continue to to become more active. But for instance, we had a a beautiful sister, young beautiful sister smart at the very beginning of the organizing and and uh, and I keep saying uh, you know as the meetings continue because we met every Sunday and uh, it was amazing because uh, one of the things that in, impact me most is the level of commitment that my brothers had for this event uh, you know, and we're not talking people, rich organizations. We're talking about people who cultivate the land, who do other things, odd jobs here and there. And they still, they came religiously every Sunday to the meetings. Mm -hmm. So this sister suddenly disappeared. She didn't no longer show up. So I, I, I asked her, one of uh, the members of her organization, what happened uh, with Susanna? Uh, we say, we don't know. She's, she's no longer coming. Uh, haven't heard from her, you know. And weeks went on. And I keep asking because she, in the very first meeting, she spoke so eloquently with such convictions uh, that it was really, really amazing. And I was really moving, I think, uh, Jose too, she, she met her and other folks. And we we did want her there. But it, it, it turned out that she, I think, that her work, it doesn't allow her. She's she's a single mom. She has, uh, her father is sick. She's probably one of the very few providers for, for the, for, for her home. So, uh, and she works the whole week no break. So if if our women and our sisters and aunts and mothers 
don't have the opportunity and haven't had the opportunity to to be leaders and to lead in ha and having positions of leadership because of the conditions of our life back home, it's going to be very hard to get women in the forefront. And I, and I, I want to make a plea that for the people who are in the Congress, that find a way to to help our sisters back home. Because yes, as Jose was saying, they should be up front, but also it's the ones who are suffering the most of all this violence. You know, the amount, just uh, the laws in El Salvador is just amazing. Uh, you can probably get uh, for abortion for a woman, to, you can get to 30 years to or to life just to have an abortion uh, or, and miscarriage. or miscarriage. Oh so it's, it's, a, it's a very strict law, oh. one of backwards laws, and it's still there. And it's still not only punished by the, 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 the nation state because her condition as a woman, she's discriminated. And, and, and you know the story well. Mm -hmm. The same thing that happened in the, in the Southwest and in Canada, you know, it's, it's embarrassing that this so-called democracy is still mistreat Indian women the way they do here. So back home, it's, it's even more dramatic. Uh, and so I do want to make a plea of, of everybody who was in the, in the Congress to take a little closer look to the condition of women back, back home because we need this, all the support we can get. I just want to add something. Um, as you were talking about the logistics and the planning and the challenges of all of that, I think um, was very, just given the current conditions of what the country is right now, it's, it's, uh, it's getting more militarized now, uh, it's definitely more authoritarian. And uh, they had to, the organizers had to navigate a lot of this stuff. Um, and, um, and you were talking about fine. I give an example. I think one, one, one a perfect example of uh, the the tippy toeing that, that they had to do in terms of finding a location, right? Now representing that this was an indigenous lab uh, where you would have essentially full say about the agenda uh, and the location or the venue had to essentially be, you know, uh, essentially aligned with what the topics, right? The colonization, mm -hmm. an anti-colonial message, an anti-status message, an anti-imperialist message, and definitely an anti-church and religion, right? Just because of the way, you know, that the role that the church had in the Salvador, the Salvador state. Uh, it was very tricky because the spaces, right, where the venue took place, you know, where the event took place, they, you know, like they have to navigate, okay, can we do it here? No, because it's tied to like some political party mm -hmm. that, you know, like that's mm -hmm. now, now nationalistic, right? Or, or it can't be, you know, like, you know, like can't be next to the church or like in the church pangula or whatever, right? Because, right, the image of the Congress, of course, right? It was very provocative, right? Uh, uh, these things were really, really challenging. Forget about like the technical stuff. <laughs> which in itself was kind of like, you know, very, 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 very wild to try to like organize and collaborate from here. But, you know, the venue, right, had to allow to have an anti-colonial decolonizing agenda and be fully aligned with what the organizers had in mind. I think that that in itself, it, it was it was it was quite, quite, quite defeat, I think. To find a place where, like you know, you you could have your open ceremony, right? Full program from beginning to end yeah. for three days. I think that in itself, uh, I think, cannot be overlooked. The challenges in in a hostile place, right, for indigenous people. And I think, I mean, you get to see. I mean, I get to see it from here, but you get to see it from like, with your own eyes yes. there. And that, that in itself, I think, was huge. I think it shouldn't be overlooked. No, absolutely. Um, the The space itself was, um, I, I don't know how to, to describe it, but 
it was a plot of land. There's beautiful trees all around. We had a giant sign that said Indigenous Congress for Decolonization. But the also the freedom to speak as radical as we could mm. was um, was certainly like one of the biggest things about the space. And I remember um, <laughs> we we actually had the grand honor, the Red Nation, for, of closing the Congress. We were the last ones to speak, I think, because we had that um, we we had that pow <laughs> at the end, <laughs> where um, we 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 went. You know, we're unapologetically um, we're unapologetic about our decolonial revolutionary politics. And I remember there was actually people who came up to us who were like, hadn't heard stuff like this before, hadn't heard women speak like this before. And um, Mayra said somebody had told her in, in Spanish was um, like, wow, the Red Nation really is about that pretty much. Mm -hmm. um, and and there was sort of like a, a shock for, <laughs> for what we had to say, but it was because you guys, secured such a free space and and that was amazing um what and I, what was the space called I, i'm still a little bit unclear like what what where was that it was a we they call it finca it was a, a plot of land that it was you know it was given to us free of charge oh wow which is uh pretty amazing uh because so uh, some members of the People who organized the event uh, knew the person, uh, but it, going back to a little bit of what Sar says is about the spaces, uh, how we navigate the spaces where uh, we could help the Congress. It, it was a big question. Uh, I remember one of the uh, the coordinating member suggests that we should do it in the church. Wow, that generate an immense, you know, our discussion. Why, sh mostly because why not you should have that there? Because after all, we're talking about the colonization, that the church is very part of that. So it, it was interesting because that also served as a school for us. It's, it's a workshop, you know, of the organizers. In, in, what is said is that the the university, the national university, who was one of the sites that we have pinpoint to to hold because it is is in San Salvador, right, the capital city, uh, it behaves it behaved very 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 poorly, very patronizing, and it was really ugly having from a high Gosh. institution. It, that kind of treatment, and, and uh, this lady stuck out like a sore thumb. Like oh, you that, knew. <laughs> oh, that was somebody else. Yeah, yeah. but but I'm this, I'm talking about the institution per se. You yeah. see, uh, in the national university, it didn't stand up for us, so we pull out of there, also. But then uh, we, in terms of the invitees, you're talking about one of the invitees, I assume. Uh, uh, we felt that this is, was indeed uh, a congress for the colonization, and it was an indigenous congress. But because the politics back home, we felt that we should invite, you know, other institutions, uh, and this is how uh, members of the Central American par Parliament were invited. But also was in the OIA, o OIS, mm -hmm. OIS, the, uh, the American AOS, States, yeah. they also were invited. Uh, and a couple of ambassadors were invited because we want them as witness in case, you know, we have our uh, some kind of police raid or something. Uh, because remember, we were under uh, the, the regime and it still is the country. We, at that point, we, st we were still mm -hmm. on the, the regime of exception, which is a, some kind of curfew. curfew. Uh, and we didn't know. Uh, we have to also contemplate the possibilities if we have uh, young people uh, and, and the police 
was going to stop, uh, uh, you know, and search, frisk, frisk, and, mm -hmm. and search and frisk, they call it, right? Uh, what we want to do if they do show up and, and trying to harass our young people. So all these have to be taken care of and, and, and taken into consideration. So we felt that that piece of land was secure enough and had, uh, we had, you know, enough protection for everybody. So all these things have to be considered once you do event back home at this time. Yeah. I even felt like we were protected by the trees even because yes, <laughs> you, know, we you walk oh, in birds. down this path and there's just all this like like plants and trees that surround the space and i had it was, it was kind of like uh because how how it is when we got to nelly it's it's like it's a it's a small town it's a town it's a village it's kind of like a city and we're there's buildings, you know, mm -hmm. that line the road, but then you look down this pathway and you see all this like green and vegetarian, uh, vegetation, vegetation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you walk in and it all completely surrounds you and it's unlike anything else on that street. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was really cool. That was very nice. Well, there is some, something maybe Jose wants to talk because yes, we please. mostly, mostly the time we all the organizers leave around except myself uh, and other couple of people live far away. So I stay in that place the whole three days. Uh, other people stay in their own home. But Jose Luis came from the other side of San Salvador, which is uh, the, the Texacuango land. And, uh, and I say, why don't you stay? Uh, he said, no, I want to go home. <laughs> and so he drew. He's every afternoon, every evening, he drove back home. Next morning, he came and he provides some breakfast for us. He came with meals. So uh, I want to know why did you stay? <laughs> <laughs> bueno. <clears throat> eh, sí, la verdad, el, el lugar fue... Fue casualidad de conseguir el lugar, no fue algo que se, que se, que se, como se dice, se organizó de esa forma. Pero la situación económica nos permitió llegar a ese lugar que usted describe. Este, y de cierta manera fue muy bonito, ideal. creo que fue lo mejor, lo ideal, creo. Eh, sí, este, bueno, yo vivo acá. Y estoy acostumbrado a viajar largas distancias, ¿no? Así que viajar de Sonsonate a San Salvador <ríe> me parece muy poco. Así de que... Y no andaba solo, tenía a mi hijo y a mi nuera, a, a, a esposa de mi hijo. ¿no? Viajaba con ellos. ¿no? Ellos estuvieron también los tres días. Por cierto, dejaron un mensaje, ¿verdad? Para que eh, se leyera cuando se estaba uh, haciendo un análisis de lo que fue el Congreso, reuniones posteriores. Así de que, eh, bueno, Nahuizalco y toda esa zona es conocida como la Ruta de las Flores, ¿verdad? que eh, ha sido creada para el turismo. Es un lugar muy bonito, pero al mismo tiempo tiene un doble propósito, desculturizarnos porque el turismo nos lleva a una cultura diferente. ¿no? Así de que es otra manera de combatirnos nosotros como, como raza indígena. ¿no? Eh, el turismo nos lleva de todo. ¿no? Y eso eh, en algún momento este, eh, nos daña. Eh, eso. Hay otra cosa que me gustaría hacer mención, desde que a pesar de que Hay bastante tierra, muy, muy buena, muy fresca, pero no está en manos de, de, de nosotros los indígenas. Son fincas que pertenecen a la oligarquía. ¿no? Eh, la gente ahí ¿no? tiene su pedazo de, de, de terreno para vivir, pero nada más. ¿no? Entonces, este, yo creo que ese es un tema muy importante a conquistar 
es tener un territorio para trabajarlo comunitariamente. Uh -huh. No lo tenemos. ¿no? Creo de que eso es algo que hay que hacer. Pero cuando empecemos a hacer eso, no sé qué nos va a pasar. Porque hasta la, ocho, hasta la fecha solo hemos hecho cosas culturales que no tocan al sistema. ¿verdad? Pero cuando empecemos a tocar el sistema, que así es, es a donde creo que vamos, vamos a ver cómo, cómo, cómo nos va. <risa> Well, honestly, that was a coincidence that we got that space. We hadn't really organized it that way. The economic situation sort of led us to getting that space, which I think was very pretty and it was um, very ideal. And well, I live here, so I'm used to traveling really long distances. So I didn't think that it was that far to travel actually for the Congress. And I also wasn't alone. I had my son and my daughter-in-law that accompanied me for the three days. And at the end, we left a message to be read when reflecting on the Congress and uh, at meetings that were to be held afterwards. Naguasinarico and that area, it's on the route of flowers, which was specifically developed for tourism. It is very pretty, but it also has a double purpose because it's meant to decultural deculturalize us to take away our culture. Tourism has a way of changing culture and it's a tool that is being used to fight against the indigenous race. Tourism brings a little bit of everything, which also over time damages us. And I'd really like to mention that what we need is good land and a lot of land, but that is not indigenous land. Those plots of land, those farms belong to the oligarchy. And people have land, but just for their house, just to live on, not a lot. And I think that that's a very important topic that we need to mention. We need a collective plot of land that we can farm together. Right now, we don't have that. And when we start to have that, I don't know what will happen. Because up until now, we've committed cultural acts. But they're only cultural acts. They don't really impact the system. But once we start to impact the system, we'll see what happens then. Okay. Thank you for explaining that. Yeah, I had to, I didn't ask very many questions about the space when I was out there. Thank you for putting it into yes. perspective. Yeah, it's a it's a sorry it's a it's a coffee coffee plantation. Whatever you saw there, there's a. Me pasa el español. Sí, es es una finca cafetalera, casi el 100% de son Sonate, Santa Ana, se produce mucho café. Por cierto, hay un lugar que es muy famoso por el café que se llama Ataco. El Ataco, si alguien, dice la gente, si alguien va a la Ruta de las Flores y no va a Ataco, no ha ido a la Ruta de las Flores porque no ha tomado café. Así de que es, es, es un lugar precioso. Su clima es eh, cálido, eh, no es caliente, no es frío, muy bonito. Bueno, ustedes lo, lo disfrutaron, se quedaron de noche. Ahí este, es un buen lugar para vivir. Well, I'll go back to Spanish. Yes, it's a coffee farm. Um, and actually in that whole area, including Sonsonate, there's a lot of coffee plantations. And there's a specific place called Ataco, That's a very well-known area for coffee. And it's said that if you go to the route of the flowers, but you don't go to a taco, well, then you haven't really gone since you haven't had the best cup of coffee. But it's very beautiful. The climate is wonderful. It's warm. It's not hot, not cold. It's very pretty. And well, you all got to enjoy it since you actually stayed overnight there. Well, it sounds like I got to go back then. I didn't really go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it, it, he's touching on a very important issue there, that that area, Western El Salvador, was actually the the land was was communal for Nahuatl people uh, and was administrated that way. When the introduction of coffee plantation uh, and the coffee the coffee grain, uh, it, it, it is a cash crop, right? So the point is to to produce more coffee they to export. 
but to be able to to produce enough coffee for for the market, you need to take away the la- the communal lands of people. So this is and the when the 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 fund after they found the Republic of El Salvador, one of the policies was to take away the communal lands. And the struggle of 1932 is precisely because the land of the Nahuatl people was taken away from them. Uh, and it's still today, as Jose Luis was saying, indigenous people in that area doesn't own land. Mm. Uh, because mostly the communal land was taken away from them. And that's true for the whole country, because after uh, the coffee grain was introduced in, back in the 1800s, uh, sugarcane also came, and cotton. Although cotton is native to the area, the sugarcane replaced them. So the Western territory of the Nahuatl became a coffee production land. And the Eastern Territory became a sugar production, of which mostly was Lenca land. So uh, the oligarchy has divided the land mostly, uh, divided the country mostly on production, on producing these grains. So it was inter- important that he said, that he bring the coffee, the coffee industry. It's so important to talk about this stuff because, you know, when we talk about so-called El Salvador and indigenous movement, it's really about land back. It's just completely a lot. It's just a no-brainer, and it's often overlooked. 1932 was about land and genocide, right, Mm -hmm. and the acquisition of ancestral lands in order for profit, for capitalism. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, along... Everything that happened in the Congress, this was kind of like the current, Mm -hmm. the undercurrent of the three days. I think it was fantastic in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. We're about at an hour. um, It's fine. And talking about land back sort of is a good segue into, I guess, um, I guess maybe we can talk a little bit about like the ultimate outcomes of the Congress. Like what a like this is sort of the beginning of an indigenous future of organizing an indigenous future. So I just, you know, what are your thoughts on that in relation to the Congress? Well, uh, I've been invited here at New York, uh, different organizations and in a sort of uh, jokingly, I say, let's make sure that we make El Salvador the stamping ground for progressive indigenous politics. Uh, I think uh, El Salvador, besides producing coffee, I think it, it, it produces uh, uh, beautiful people who can take this on uh, and uh, and I think uh, this Congress have shown that international uh, solidarity, uh, specifically for the area of Central America, is key right now. It's, uh, we cannot allow governments to continue with the usual policies of, you know, you backyard, this is the USA backyard, or it's the Banana Republic, and now it's the the Northern Triangle. The USA invested $1 million daily during the war in El Salvador. Uh, and they're responsible for, for what's going on now. Uh, they're responsible for losing a whole generation of young people right now. Uh, they're responsible for taking the land. They in, intervened in Guatemala in 1954. They intervened in Nicaragua in the 1930s. So their constant imperialist war, they waged on Central America, is, 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 is recurring the story, uh, the history of, El, of the area uh, and the geopolitics. So I think it, uh, it, El Salvador could 
could be a, a good posi a good is in good position for the international indigenous movement to 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 look and 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 we can work together because there is lots of experiences to gain from the war the civil war and and also of the experience of Guatemala uh, Mayan struggle uh, in Nicaragua and Honduras now. Uh, so I think it, if we manage to get the, the progressive indigenous movement back to El Salvador at one point, of course, we're not going to get everybody. But I think there, there are issues, as you were saying, uh, they're very similar to the Southwest in particular. But I think it is, I, I will agree with SAR too, that the, the, the issues for Native people are very similar all over the, the world right now. And, and, and I think uh, if we sort of concentrate and, and, and get this going, I think it's, it can be a good platform. Uh, I think El Salvador is continuously on, for good or bad, is continuously in the news. And this time we didn't make any noise, much noise about the Congress, but I think in, in the next time around, if we come full forces, indigenous peoples, to Central America, I think we, we can really make uh, some changes in terms of, specifically in terms of USA politics towards the area. And, for indigenous people. So it is an open door, uh, it's an open call, uh, and let's hope, let's hope that, uh, that something can happen, yeah. As a collective, I think, uh, if you reflect on, you know, the experience of the Congress, we have an indigenous-led struggle that has opened the door for the diaspora to engage and specifically young people. I think the way we saw this as a collective was like there was young people, young, young Central Americans looking to reconnect with their roots. And what we're trying to figure out is like how to create a bridge that honors, right, their struggle and this curiosity as well of the diaspora wanting to have a genuine reconnection to their indigenous roots and what would that look like? It's not gonna be perfect. It's kind of muddy, it can be gray at times, right? Because you're dealing with mestizaje, issues of identity, mm -hmm. right? And of course, in nation building, right? Because you folks identify as Salvadoran, what does that mean, whatever, but I, I, I've stopped identifying as such because um, I don't wanna be part of a nation building project. I wanna dismantle that as an individual, right? And I think we're looking for people who are asking those questions as young people. What would that look like, right? And I'm not looking to give legitimacy to a regime or anything like that. But we're looking to bring light to indigenous struggles and how you can collaborate in a way that really honors, you know, this curiosity that people want and how to genuinely connect with people. Because they're, they're like, we're out there. Like the main reason why I returned back home is because I wanted an answer to those questions myself. Uh, and and I think they presented a, an alternative, I think, um, on how to reclaim that knowledge, how like really honor that, how to settle, how to be humble about that stuff. It's hard, it's not easy because we're so far away, but more and more like you have like these children of diaspora born here asking questions, like how, you know, why my family came here. It just really goes back all the way, not even to 1932, it really goes, way back to colonial conquest. It really does. And if you if you read Salvadoran history, it only took 11 years for indigenous people to revolt when they realized that the project of the Republic of El Salvador was not for them, you know? And mm -hmm. the state came back and like, try to That's my them, motherland. Right? right, so it only took, like it only took 11 years, yeah. right? And. And they they realize no, no, this is not the project exactly. So, so I think I think those are the questions that I was trying to. I see other diaspora doing the same thing, you know. Um, and I think that's what collective Nopa is about. Mm -hmm. 
Sí. Eh, es un trabajo muy complicado tratar de, de, de conectar la diáspora hacia nuestro país por el hecho de que la mayoría de nosotros no tenemos identidad. Eso hace que la nueva generación que nace acá eh, tenga uh, una idea de trabajar para El Salvador. Eh, lo hacen indirectamente, pero no es eh, algo que eh, beneficie de cierta manera a nuestra raza. Económicamente, eh, nosotros aportamos a El Salvador anualmente 800 mil millones de dólares. Eh, es más de lo que el presupuesto de la nación requiere. ¿verdad? Pero ese dinero, eh, que sería una estrategia si lo pudiéramos eh, desviar uh, hacia, hacia, hacia las comunidades ancestrales, pero ese dinero está siendo utilizado uh, o está llegando, mejor dicho, a manos de la gran empresa. O sea, el, la economía tradicional, la economía de la nación, vive por la diáspora. Hoy en día, ellos lo saben muy bien, eh, la oligarquía sabe, sabe muy bien eso, hoy en día el negocio más grande ya no es la tierra, ya no es la producción de café, de caña de azúcar, de, algo, de algodón, de añil, hoy es la migración, porque nos envía remesas. La, la remesa es, es, es el producto que les beneficia más y les cuesta menos. No les cuesta un centavo uh, hacer que uno de nosotros se migre. ¿verdad? Pero a cambio de, de esa migración, pues ellos reciben un gran beneficio. Así de que yo creo de que eh, la llave para poder hacer un, una transformación es a través de una educación no tradicional, una, 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 una educación de culturización o de reculturización, ¿verdad? recuperar nuestra cultura. Pero eso lo puede hacer el arte, lo puede hacer el, la universidad. Uh -huh. Creo de que ustedes están siendo llamados para ocupar un espacio eh, que defina ese sueño, que es un sueño. Gracias. Well, that's a very complicated work to reconnect with the diaspora and have them reconnect with the country because most of us have lost our identity and we have this new generation that was born here. And the idea is to have them now working for El Salvador. And that's what they've been doing indirectly, but it doesn't really benefit our race. Economically, the country depends on the diaspora. They send $800 billion dollars to the country. And this money would be fantastic if it were going to our ancestral communities, but it's truly ending up in the pockets of big business. The traditional economy is living off of the diaspora and the oligarchy knows this. Big business in El Salvador is no longer coffee. It's no longer sugar cane or cotton or anything else. It's immigration, it's remittances. This is the product that brings the country the biggest benefit and it produces no costs. It doesn't take a cent for someone to migrate away from the country, but the country itself receives the greatest benefit. So I think that the key for transformation is to have an education that is not traditional. That is to say that it should be rooted in culture and recovering our culture. And this could be done through art, through university, as you've seen. And really here, we feel this call to occupy space and to define our dreams and to dream. Uh, 
Well, yeah, that's um, that brings up a whole other bunch of questions for me. <laughs> but it's been amazing to listen to this. Thank you. Um, um, being in New York for the week of um, the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues and sort of talking with people and meeting uh, different people, helping out uh, the Leonard Peltier Defense Committee and uh, seeing, uh, seeing like people in the streets um, advocating for themselves, fighting for their nations and their people. It sort of, uh, I don't know, it, it just uh, brings me, it, it, it's, it's been really like uh, recentering to what I'm doing like in this work in the Red Nation and being a, an internationalist and being a revolutionary and what it really all means and taking all that back home with me. So um, again, it just um, recenters like what I'm doing here and, and why I'm here. So thank you so much for this conversation. And I always keep um, our relatives from the South in my heart as we do this work. And thank you. we'll, um, as the Red Nation, we'll promise to um, give our side of the story and our thoughts. We still have to record a debrief episode <laughs> months later, but it takes all the time to like, like just digest and grasp like what we actually did mm -hmm. and i'm really glad like we're having this conversation yeah, first before too. we uh, before we have a debrief on our side i do wish i had um the others here with me but you know like we had you know said throughout this episode uh, we are all busy in our lives trying to survive mm -hmm. trying you know keep up with our families keep mm -hmm. up with our works and all of that and then organize a indigenous future on top of all of that <laughs> so thank you so much for being here um i just want to uh, i think one um just uh one thing before we end um because we did introduce d into this podcast <laughs> uh d didn't get to go with us to the congress but i'm wondering like um being in new york uh during this week and listening to this conversation now um and being a member of the Red Nation, what is your uh, like perspective and closing thoughts? Tomorrow we leave, we're going back to New Mexico. Um, what has this experience provided for you? I was actually gonna share this like kind of like off the record because <laughs> it's, uh, I feel like what I, what I took a lot from just learning everything here within this just it's only been like five days six days but it has a lot to do with like the prayer that we carry with like the red nation um and it's really interesting the way like this conversation developed like this this uh this episode developed because i feel like a lot of it centered on how we treat women and also like how we have to continue that work to not only honor our women, but like put women at the center. Um, and this prayer that I, that the Red Nation carries that, that I carry right now um, has a lot to do with like the, when, when this, when this, uh, when this bundle was created and was presented to us. And this is, this, this, uh, we call it our baby because it's just a small, it's a small bundle. And I'll share it with you all after the cameras are off and everything. But um, when it was created, it was said like, you know, this is, this this prayer, what we what the Red Nation stands for, which is like the liberation of our, of our people and the liberation of indigenous people everywhere. Um, it only works when the female and the male energies come together. There can't be like an imbalance and it, it, it's, it, it, I saw a lot of that this week. I saw a lot of just like, you know, it's not just, it's not just men. It shouldn't just be all men, but it's not also not just all women. It shouldn't just be all women. Like there's like a, there was like a, there's like a perfect balance this whole week. And it's, I don't know, for me, it's, it's, uh, 
it's uh it's beautiful hearing other men talk about like how you know not within the red nation but outside saying like hey like we're 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 talking about like honoring our women not like in a real cheesy way which i feel like a lot of specifically my leaders do like they just like oh but like actually working (laughs) and like dedicating your life to hey like our women they take care of us when we're when we're born and we also identify like what keeps them like out of power like like the expectations we keep on 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 these women um but i don't know it's it's for me it's a it's a bit overwhelming i it's it's uh it's a bit it's it's beautiful um but i that's all i gotta yeah, that's it. Oh, dude, thank you so much. That, that was really that hits. I'll just I'll just add one last thing. I couldn't have done this trip without you. That's really crazy. <laughs> you're bringing up this balance because yeah. <laughs> coming out, I was fully prepared to come here alone. Yeah. <laughs> I just I just roll like that sometimes, even though I shouldn't. And thank you so much for your help on this trip. Mm-hmm. And thank you for um, uplifting the Leonard Peltier Defense Committee. Thank you, Collectivo Milpa. Thank you, Danielle, Juan mm-hmm. Luis, mm-hmm. and our wonderful translators, Samantha. Um, we'll continue. We'll, we'll continue, continue these conversations and we'll keep working for an indigenous future. I think uh, when the Red Nation closed the Congress, we really centered on uh, the Red Deal, which actually today is April twentieth. Yeah, it is the Red Deal's third birthday. Oh, yeah! yeah. <laughs> Happy that's birthday, it. Red Deal! Yeah. And um, that's our plan for an Indigenous future. And um, we met people outside, of, or we met other organizers here in in New York City, and uh, of. of such a diverse amount of people and whenever they ask us like oh you're a native organizer and we get to talking about our wildest hopes and dreams uh we talk about the red deal and and um just last night i was talking about um my greatest hopes and dreams as a, an indigenous revolutionary from um that lives in the united states uh my greatest hopes and dreams is the plurinational estate of turtle island where um all the indigenous tribes get back their land, as much land, public lands, federal lands. We take back some lands. Maybe some settlers give us back our lands. And we Swiss cheese the U.S. We, we succeed from the U.S. and create our own plurinational estate. And we band together with our brothers and sisters in the South. And we create an anti-imperialist decolonial future. Um, really for our people and our nations, but also for the earth. That's what the Red Deal is. It's a, it's a plan for, uh, it's climate action to save our earth because either the U.S. and imperialism, it will continue to exist or our world will continue to exist. No, it's one or the other mm-hmm. and we'll choose our world every single time. Mm-hmm. So thank you so much for this solidarity and the solidarity is forever until our freedom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you.